every single day that we do something digital, we are potentially leaving a trace out there. Getting up unprecedented amounts of information. Large databases. You're taking data together and you're manipulating it and you're looking at it through different views. That's Anonymity on the web is pretty interesting. How do we control our online privacy? I'm going to make it really easy for them to figure out exactly who you are. Some people might worry that uh, there's too much freedom to individuals using the internet, that uh, somehow governments will disappear because people will be able to do whatever they want to. I don't think that's a likely outcome, frankly. Uh, the internet exists in the real world. It exists in a society that we all inhabit, or multiple societies, multiple cultures. Uh, it's absolutely uh, essential to understand that the internet and the notion of cyberspace is not divorced from the real world. We live in the real world, the internet lives in the real world. Our interactions with each other are not in some fictitious, uh, you know, strange planet somewhere else. They are part of the world we live in. In addition to the end-to-end -end principle, uh, the principle that the intelligence lies at the edges of the internet rather than in the core, which just forwards the packets from one computer to another, there's also the fact that the internet is a many-to-many -many medium. Most of the media that we had previously, at least the technological media, were many-to-one or one-to-many. The BBC broadcast system, for example, is one-to-many. You've got one company broadcast content to tens of millions of users. But with the internet, you have millions of people creating their own content and millions of people consuming this content. And for the most part, they're communicating fairly directly with each other. Okay. And that makes it fundamentally difficult to censor. So a uh, document is uh, something you write a letter to your friend, but your calendar is data. So w the different thing about data, when you look at the calendar data, you don't read the data itself. You look at a day view or you look at a week view or month view. Uh, you can take all the calendars of your friends and smush them together so that you've got them on the same day. You can ask the calendar to do work things out, like when will your, all your friends be available to go and have lunch. You can put onto the calendar information, which is uh, other information, which is public, all kinds of things uh, when groups are playing near you, football. How would they get from that to actually figuring out, for instance, who you are? Um, well, it's well known in the privacy world that uh, things like your birth date, um, your gender, um, and your postal code or zip code uh, will allow people to figure out who you actually are, what your true name is. Now, how might a website get that information from you? Um, well, let's say you want to sign up for a horoscope. Then you're going to give them your birth date and probably tell them whether or not you're a man or a woman. Then maybe you want uh, to find out what your local weather is. Um, Probably the easiest way to do that is to put in your postal code or zip code. Uh, and bingo, they've got three pieces of information that uh, are going to make it really easy for them to figure out exactly who you are. There are a variety of threats to privacy online. The worst case scenario would be when information about a person is collected by a large, powerful institution, whether public or private. Privacy matters because we all need a margin of uh, discretion around our lives so that we can exercise some control over them. The fact of the matter is that uh, we've already long ago given up much of our privacy as soon as we started to email and use mobile telephones. But if you thought about what it would be like if your neighbors knew details of your bank account or your medical record or could listen into your quarrels with your spouse, you would be very disconcerted because you would feel that you were losing control over areas of your life that just belong to you. That's why privacy really matters. And the, the great worry that we have in the digital age is that we've already given so much of it up, both to private agencies and to public ones. Well, wh one way in which you'll give up personal information is obviously um, by clicking on one thing or another that reveals the sorts of things you're interested in. All this kind of information about what it is that you're interested in gets used by advertisers to figure out how they're going to uh, target. Um, and then it goes a step further, right? I mean, because they're building up 
essentially profiles. They're building up dossiers and files about the people who visit various websites. Um, and they will be able to glean that, you know, you're a person who likes to travel, uh, you're a person who uh, likes to cook, uh, so on and so forth. But it is a political issue. Um, people put their lives on the screen. They put really intimate details of their lives out there. And with very little thought that there might be people using that information in ways that are not uh, benign. You know, I don't know where to take my daughter to teach her that. When we go through the Mass Pike and there's Easy Pass, my car is tracked, my, you know, every, there are surveillance cameras all over. We're, we're both giving up unprecedented amounts of information on, for in, in profiling. Um, I think that it's, a, it's hard to teach the relationship between privacy and democracy, and it's also hard to teach the relationship between intimacy and privacy. You know, what is intimacy without privacy? But I'm not afraid of Google or Apple or Facebook. I know who they are. I know what they're doing. No, what I'm afraid of is that unknown villain, that person making anonymous threats, that company that I've never heard of, that has unbelievable amounts of data about me and my family. So I wanted to know, what could someone find about me, online to offline? So I created my own villain, simply by giving them my name, Danelle Dixon. And here's what they found. My physical addresses for the last 25 years, my email addresses for the last 25 years, hundreds of pages from my divorce and custody proceeding that contained highly personal information about me and my family. This is what scares me. It was so simple. It took them just a few hours to know more about me than my parents do. One of the biggest innovations in surveillance in the past few years has come about as a result of the spread of social networking sites and of social facilities and all sorts of other sites. Because once people make visible who their friends are, it's possible to do clustering analysis and start looking for covert communities. Now, in the old days, this was difficult. You had to send out your field intelligence staff to live in the villages and ask who was friends with whom and who was related to whom and so on. And you would then, if, if people had phones, you'd look at their itemized phone bills and you'd look at which households were phoning whom. But nowadays, information on who is whose friend is available on sites like Facebook and the 40 other such sites that there are worldwide. Again, what, what constitutes private information, right? It's from an adult's perspective, it's identifying information is their absolute fear, right? The idea that it's your name, your address, your phone number, anything that will identify you. And this has to do with the idea of physical risk. But for young people, it's about the, you know, all right, fine, you can call me by my name. Why is that a big deal? It's more about the things that make you vulnerable. And so when we think about privacy and private information, it's really a question of vulnerability. And so from an adult perspective, we're really concerned about physical vulnerabilities um, and increasingly about psychological vulnerabilities. And for a lot of young people, it's about social vulnerabilities. So, you know, how do I make certain that I don't get teased, harassed, bullied um, because of the things that I make available out there? How do I make certain that what I put out there makes me seem cool and not, and not lame? How do I balance that? So the social vulnerability is the privacy fight for young people. The physical and psychological is the fight for parents. And so we see these two constantly at odds because part of putting things out in public is to achieve status, you need to actually make yourself as vulnerable at a certain level. And how do you actually do that in a way that balances the risks and the benefits? Everything from your groceries delivered to your door to your online purchasing history, to something as simple as your free email account. These are all windows to our identity, behavior, and even ideological preferences that these companies mine and then sell. Some companies have figured out how to exploit the data economy by offering us services that we seemingly enjoy without respecting an individual's right to data privacy. See, I argue that an individual's right to digital identity data is a fundamental 
human right. All technology that we create in this day and age must reflect that right. In fact, organizations like ID2020, W3C, People-Centered Internet, Rebooting Web of Trust, they're all working towards that goal already. Every single day that we do something digital, we are potentially leaving a trace out there and that if somebody wanted to find out where we were shopping, what we were doing, who we were communicating with, uh, why we were doing it, what websites we uh, were logging on to, they could do it. Uh, it's, it's a very, very exposed set of media, these uh, uh, electronic communication devices that we now use. And uh, the point is that they're fantastically convenient. And none of us would be would willingly give them up. That is what we're doing online. We are clothing ourselves in data, unawares, and we are being judged as we're walking around the internet by who the cookies say we are um, and who we declare we are by our Facebook profile or our Twitter stream or um, you know uh, what information we put into whatever website we might go to. Some of us are more aware than others that this is occurring. Most of us honestly have no idea and if it got turned off tomorrow would be upset because all of a sudden the services we had wouldn't be as good because Amazon wouldn't know what they know about you and eBay wouldn't know what they know about you, and uh, for whatever reason, when you went to your favorite news site, the uh, content you got wasn't customized to who you are, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, we're not aware of... As we go online, um, the deal is relatively straightforward. So when you go on Amazon, and you click, and as you click through from product to product to product, you start to see the recommendations appear, either based on your past history or more typically your session. You know, as you start looking for cameras, you start to see people who clicked, who, who looked at this also looked at that. People who bought this, people who clicked at this bought that. Um, you know, in, this, in the course of your clicking, the service becomes more useful to you. They, the, ex, the implicit, and for many people, the explicit trade-off is that in exchange for watching over your shoulder, as you shop, we will help you shop better. If you think about retail over the last couple hundred years, a shopkeeper would get to know their individual customers and they would stock the things that they thought made sense to the individual customers. So there was personalization on a kind of ad hoc basis as one person would do it. And the real change came with computers and data systems, where there was large-scale retailers now able to use large databases with lots of, say, all of your credit card history, or now lots of um, hypermarkets have store cards, and you're able to store all that information so they can do a better job. And the web's not unique. It's just one more data source in the total data pie. Um, credit cards, um, your shopping history, your travel history, um, your web history, these are all various aspects of the ability for companies to use computers to try to serve the consumer better because all those companies are always competing for the consumer's business. We agreed to it when we hit accept on some privacy policy somewhere. But no matter how in control that you think you are of your privacy, you are not. We're not aware of the information shadow that we cast and the response to that shadow that, that occurs automatically now. Um, but as a culture, we are going through that process right now to have to catch up with the fact that we've all kind of logged in. We, we're not there yet. And we, and we don't understand the implications of it, but we sense it. I mean, we're not dumb. We're social beings, and we want to be out there. We just don't have a clear picture of where we are, <laughs> you know? And, and we're going to get there, and we're going to, I think the way we get there, uh, but we still don't have the ability to control all of our information. Why is that? It's because we haven't demanded it. And most companies, they think that we don't even care about it. But we know that we can change behaviors of companies just by our reactions. But technology, it can only solve part of the problem. It can build this really powerful control center, but it can't change our behavior. We need to do that. We need to work together to create a better future.